friends. Ask a Flower Farmer. It's our time together. We come here every Wednesday at 1230. And it's my pleasure to be here. My name is Lisa Mason Ziegler. If, you, if you're new um, to us or have just found us and welcome aboard, during this window of about 30 minutes, um, you can post questions that have anything to do with flower farming, seed starting, cool flowers, um, flower farming business, even farm dogs. You just will, I'll do my best to actually um, answer them. And nowadays, we are actually posting the questions just in um, the comments because our little bubble with the question mark, which is the easiest way for me to find the questions, isn't working. It hasn't been working for the last few weeks. So if you have a question, just um, post it down there. And um, so let's see, let's catch up. So we here in South, so I'm in Southeastern Virginia, right? And we're in zone 8A now, according to the USDA, which we've known that all along, but now it's official. And we just had our first low, really low temp last night. We went down the 20s, low 20s. And so Bobo, two days ago, um, let's see, today's Wednesday. Monday, Bobo put all of our row covers up. Um, while we typically only plant those cool season hardy annuals that are winter hardy in our zone, um, there's no reason to not give them some added protection, right? Um, and because for us, we live in a really windy area, and usually when these cold fronts come in, they bring a lot of wind with them. And that cold wind whips your little transplants up, y'all. Um, and so we use row cover primarily to protect our plants from that wind storm or that just constant wind, as well as um, to stop deer and rabbits from grazing. And in fact, we had one tunnel that's been up for about a week or more because the deer, deer love Godisha or Clarkia. Um, they just will go past everything else and just eat it. And they had started doing that. So Bobo put a um, cover on that last week in which just, they just don't even realize it's there. Um, so row cover has a lot more uses, y'all. And I can't imagine growing cool season hardy annuals, fall planting, or even very early spring planting without having row covers. So I'm just here to say, if you are planting cool flowers, you should have enough row cover and hoops and weights to protect your plants. We feel like that's a really big part of why we're so successful with cool flowers. The row covers are not given cold protection. It's the wind and the varmints. It's these other problems of winter um, gardening. So um, let me just scroll back up here to the top and see if we have any questions. Someone's asking, um, what roses do I grow? I do not grow roses. Um, and in fact, most um, domestic flower farmers, meaning local flower farmers, don't grow roses. There are a few that are actually, that's become their niche. Um, but there's a whole lot of other flowers um, that we grow that um, are not readily shippable. Um, so roses are just not one that we have ever really pursued, right? Um, so what are the cool flowers you're starting in 37 days? So that is, I have my little countdown going on. Um, and so what most people tend to focus on when we talk about cool flowers um, is what they really jump right on right away is the fall planted stuff, which, I mean, that's totally, that is like the best opportunity to get the healthiest, most abundant plants is by planting them in the fall let them spend the winter getting established and settled in to just be ready to take off in spring, right? And that's big, um, especially I live in 8A. I can pretty much almost plant everything in the fall, cool season, hardy annual in the fall. But there's a second window of opportunity and everybody can plant cool flowers in what is called very early spring. Very early spring is six to eight weeks before your last frost. This ticket is though, you have to have prepared this place you're gonna plant them, usually in the fall, because, usually, because it gets cold, frozen, wet, 
snow covered, ice covered, so you can't prepare soil at that time of the year. So you do have to have some forethought. So in fact, I could be starting all cool flowers in very early, for a very early spring. And we start those like the first week in January um, because my very early spring planting date, my last classic frost is mid-April, makes it really easy because then eight weeks before that is Valentine's Day, right? So Valentine's Day is mid-February. So we start starting seeds for that planting as soon as we come back from Christmas. That's what I'm doing the first week or two and three, actually. Um, so I'm pretty vigorous seed starting through January, but then the seed starting really slows down for about a month. Uh, because it's really too early during February for me to start warm season tender annuals, right? So what am I starting? I could be starting any and every um, very cool flower, any cool season hardy annuals. Um, and big ones for us that we don't fall plant, that we start are straw flowers and stock. Both of them are really important um, crops for us or have always been. Um, and I'm sorry, y'all, I'm just trying to scroll for questions while I'm talking here, which is why it was always so convenient. Well, let's see if it works. I see somebody posted a question. Oh, the questions are back, y'all. Okay. So we are back to, if you want me to answer your question, and I will check the comments since people have been doing that. If you want me to answer a question, Post it in that little bubble with the question mark in the bottom. That just helps me to see your question and I don't miss it. All right, so here's one. Morning, could you talk eucalyptus care, please? I have some that is eight feet tall. Should I cut this down to knees? Will it regrow 7B, 8A? Yes, so for sure you have to really cut it back. Dave Dowling is the one that coached me on that, um, and he had me cut them back to about 12 inches tall. Hardest thing I've ever done, right? Because they were super tall. But you can't protect them beyond that. Um, so I cut them back to 12 inches, and then I actually mulched them in loose leaves. When I say loose, I mean they're packed, but it's not like bark. It was leaves which tend to breathe a little bit more. Um, about 12 inches deep, and then I hooped and double row covered because we use lightweight row cover. And last year, even last year, we wintered over polyanthemus, silver drop, and parvula gum. Parvula gum was the highest survival. I mean, I don't think we lost one plant. It was really pretty dadgum amazing how well it worked. Um, but I will, polyanthemus was mixed, but I will say that was at the head of the bed, which wasn't protected perhaps the very best that it could be. Um, so cut it back, mulch it, double row cover it, um, and wish for the best. But what I was gonna say is, ours even went through that polar blast in December last year, which was kind of early in the season, right? Um, and they all survived. So I have great hope. We're actually not wintering over any this year because we're kind of changing up our garden. So we'll be starting more seed in January and hopefully next winter we'll be wintering over more. The benefit of overwintering eucalyptus is unprecedented in first year eucalyptus. I mean, the volume of stems, the height, just the vigorousness of it um, is really good. But the next best thing is to start, um, eucalyptus is a slow grower, just like Lysianthus. And so we start that, that is another one that we start right in January early um, to have it bigger when we plant it out in mid-April. So thanks for asking that. As a young person in flower farming, hello, as a young person, is flower farming a, realist, a realistic profession for city folk? Well, I don't, um, so first off, if you're asking how much money you can make, that 100% depends on um, the model you choose, your skill, your experience. I mean, if you look at somebody like Jenny Love that is a farmer florist, um, I mean, she'll tell you that she grossed um, a lot of money from doing being a farmer florist. Um, I can't remember the number, and I don't want to quote it incorrectly, but it was a high, very, very high number. Um, and, but it's a lot of work. 
But once you figure that out, if you are just going to grow flowers and sell them wholesale, and if, when you're saying you're a city folk, does that mean you don't have much land? That doesn't give you as much options. I will tell you that we here um, grew on an acre and a half. Um, of at our height of production and we were producing 10 to 15,000 stems of flowers a week how much money you make again totally depends on did you wholesale them did you retail them what is your skill set do you sell them all I mean there's that is just such a loaded question so I would say yes first off it is definitely a viable career we have many families that are flower farmers as their family income um, but not everybody wants to do it that way. The, I would say the lion's share of the people that I teach are people that are looking for that second income, whether it's somebody that is either just loves gardening and thought, shoot, I just want to, I want to love, would love to do this and would love to do it um, at a profit and create income. We have lots of mamas that have stay at home kids. We have a lot of people that are entering into retirement years that just want to have something to fill their time and to make a profit. Um, and so that is a really loaded question that's not easily answered, but for sure. I mean, this cut flower industry is, you know, billions of dollars every year, right? So there is definitely sales, but it's 100% um, dependent on the skill of the business person and the flower farmer, you know, because how many businesses start and are no longer there after two years? 90%, not flower farmers, businesses in general. Um, so it really depends on the person. What we see in the flower farming industry is a high rate of failures because it's so easy to just start growing flowers in your backyard and then they just kind of, kind of think, well, I, I could sell some, and they don't really do it as professionals, meaning um, making it easy for people to buy your flowers, pricing your flowers competitively with the market, not just what you think you should be selling them for. I mean, undercutting, I mean, people that are growing professionally get undercut by these folks that come in and just saying, oh, well, I'm just not really doing it for a real business. I'm just going to sell mine really cheap. Well, not only will you not be able to continue doing that because you have to be able to pay the cost of what you're doing, but it really hurts the whole industry. Um, and so there's just a lot of opportunity. But again, it totally depends on people getting a little bit of education before they do it. We aren't born knowing this stuff, y'all. You have to get help. Uh, anybody, would you just wake up tomorrow morning? I love giving this example. Would you wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know what? I think I'm going to open a copy machine store. I'm going to go lease a space, buy some copiers, and just start selling them. Heck no, you wouldn't do that. You would lose your shirt, right? I mean, you have to have a little bit of foundation to stand on. And we just find that it's really easy for people to kind of just go from gardening and to try to start doing this. And they don't have any um, guidelines or they don't know anything. Um, and then they kind of say it doesn't work. Well, it does work. You just have to, like, have what you need to do it. Thanks for asking. Hello, good afternoon. What advice would you recommend for starting flower for starting flower farming in zone 6B? Um, well, for starting flower farming would be the same no matter where you are. Um, you know, it's first off getting a little bit of education. You have to have seed money, and when I say seed money, I don't mean just for seeds. Um, and Bobo's laughing in the background. Bobo's over there starting seeds. Um, we're starting seeds for demonstrations for video and stuff. Um, it's the basics, same for everybody. You know, our courses, Flower Farm and School Online, were not, were started based on us having to be able to help people to see the steps you have to follow to start a flower farm whether it's the business, what to grow, where to get customers, how to harvest and condition, how to set up a garden, a working garden, how to learn how to do weed prevention, and then how to grow more stuff once you get your foot in the door, and then how to really expand with structures, hoops, and greenhouses. Um, you know, those courses are not fluff, y'all. They are taught by industry leaders that have actually done it, and um, they just 
have all the bits and pieces. So my advice to you is get educated. Um, and joining the ASCFG is another big one. Um, and so check out Flower Farm and School Online. We have a whole library. They're all on demand now, meaning you can purchase them at any time. My course is the basics. Dave Dowling is the bulbs, perennials, and woodies. And Stephen Gretel's is hoops and structures. And those three courses can take you from, to, from zero to 100 miles an hour over time um, to tap into the industry and to really get going. So that's my advice. No matter where, that would be for anybody anywhere. Cultivating the heart. I have find it hard to get my flowers out there. Have gone to some florists with samples, been good-ish, and then ordered some. Do you have any advice on ways to get out there? No farmer's markets, though. So, you know, again, um, I think that it's really easy to get discouraged you know, I probably spent five years building my business before I was really up and crazy busy all the time. Um, you know, first off, again, um, with florists, florists was our bread and butter, you know. I mean, they were our meat and potatoes, I guess you would say. They were the ones that really paid our bills. They were dependable. But it took me time, and there were a lot of reasons for that. One is the quality of the flowers you're selling them. That's the first thing I would think of. Are your flowers, I mean, you might think they look good, but are they really lasting? Do they not have insects on them? You know, are they what they can use? Are you not growing specialty colors? You know, we never grew specialty colors. This is this kind of stuff. And this is a bunch of dried stuff, right? We grew um, just staple flowers that they could use every single week. I so often see flower farming, farmers um, going down the rabbit hole of growing, like for instance, like right now, and just wait until March. All these people that have spent gazillions of dollars on tulips, um, tulips that bloom earlier than you think they're going to, most often they bloom sometimes before you have anything else to go with them so and but or like you don't your market doesn't start until later in the season or you're selling to florist and you're trying to sell to florist but you aren't really set up with them yet so they aren't really dependent on you and you can't sell them i find that we built our business on growing the staple flowers, not specialty flowers, like tulips and ranunculus and anemones. And all those will ultimately sell after you've proven your worth to these people and that you are a pro. Then they're going to spend the extra money to buy perhaps the higher dollar types of crops from you. Um, and so what I would think of is the quality of your flowers, the way they have to reach out to you to buy, it is so easy for them to go online and just buy flowers from wholesalers. Um, and so those were the two things that I would think of and consistency. Um, but for us, I learned that growing these staple flowers that florists use every single day of their business versus lots of blushes and, and those colors that they use for events, which a lot of flower farmers focus on. Well, guess what? If they don't have an event that week, they don't need your flowers. But guess what they did buy every week, week after week after week? You know, sunflowers and zinnias and coxcomb and marigolds, all the stuff that a lot of growers kind of poo-poo. Um, it's like, that's what we built our business on. So my quality, consistency, and what is it are you offering to them? If you want them to buy every week, you have to sell, have the flowers they can use every week. So hopefully that helps. 7B, 8A, have beds prepped and ready with hoop and ag covers if needed. Way to go. Can I start more cool flower seasons now and plant right, plant right out or success rate? So... Bobo and I were just discussing this over lunch because we went from fairly mild conditions to the 20s. Um, and it was just a reminder to me um, why it's so essential to get your cool season hardy annuals and fall planting in the ground that's around that six to eight week window. Some of us plant a little bit later because fall just seems to go on and on, which is my case. But... They have to have at least a few weeks 
to be able to get established. I mean, you want them to grow some roots. Nobody's growing roots at 20 degrees outside, right? So, you know, if you're in a hoop house, maybe, but of course I don't grow in structures, but that's, I would resist planting cool flowers now. I would wait for the next window, very early spring. You know, that's what you should be gearing up for. And that's what I'm really trying to bring to the forefront for people is it's like, all right, the month of December, we kind of take off from seed starting generally for the farming. So we are arrested and ready to hit the ground running in January. In the month of January, I am wide open starting cool season hardy annual seeds plus a couple of slow growers like eucalyptus. Then we're month of February, we're not we're not starting so many seeds because it's really too early for our very for our warm season tender annuals, right? March, we hit the ground running again. So February is a month we do a lot of other prep type of work. So I would say resist starting that because you're even colder than me. If you're 7B slash 8A, and if y'all haven't checked the USDA updated their um, winter hardiness zone, and we got bumped to 8A, I mean, we've kind of, we've been living in those conditions. Um, but anyway, you might be reclassified. Where, where do we find help with determining sales prices for markets and florists? What a great question. Um, so that's one of the things that um, we teach about in flower farming school, the basics, the places. There is no one place to go, first off, out of the gate. There is no one source for you to go to. There's several different sources, and then you have to add into the equation what your situation is and what market you're selling to. So we teach about that in flower farming school. And then another source that we add into that is the ASCFG, which is the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Um, they poll growers every year to ask them to submit what they're charging retail and wholesale um, and try to get a collective jumping off point. So it's not that cut and dry, but that's where you start. Um, and, you know, we are big believers in networking with other growers in your region. Um, and that's something that you, I mean, that's something that we work together on to, like, not undercut each other, to kind of charge fair market value. Um, and that could be a whole discussion in itself. Um, and that's why we, that's another one of the reasons. It's like flower farm and school online is just offers all of these steps that we figured out after all these years of doing it, right? Um, so, hope that helps. Deer have taken out my fall planted cool flowers. I'm in Texas 8B, now 8-9A. Can you restart the cool flowers now or must I wait until very early spring? Last frost is April 1st. It really depends on your conditions, so you're pretty deep south. If you're 8B, 9A, and your ground maybe doesn't freeze, then if your ground doesn't freeze uh, with hoops, row covers, and proper weight bags, that'll A, will keep the deer from eating your stuff. Secondly, um, and if I'm starting now, I would get those hoops and row covers up where you're gonna plant. That'll help keep the ground from getting too cold. You know, bright sunshine days really do a lot to help that environment. Um, and we use Bio360, that's the biodegradable film. And that black film under that row cover just really helps to keep it just a smidgen more warm. Um, so if your ground doesn't freeze, go for it. Otherwise, wait. But you're, or I mean, I would say you'd be starting now to be planting. So eight weeks before April is February 1st. So you need to be starting cool flowers now for your very early spring planting, right? When I start more cool flowers in January, do I still use the cookie cooling rack using spare bedroom? Temperature will be much cooler than in September. Thanks so much. So, Kim, that's a great question. So, what she's asking, we follow um, cool season hardy annuals. Most of them definitely need some warmth for their seeds to sprout, but they don't need it hot like most like warm season tender annuals. So, to provide that to our seedlings or our seeds to sprout, 
We put a cookie cooling rack on top of our heat mat, which makes a little airspace about this wide um, to like just cool it down just a smidgen, but it still provides consistent warmth. It will definitely depend on what your air temperature is. If your air temperature is below maybe 60 degrees in that room, then I'd try it without the cookie cooling racks. But if it's above 60, I'd still use the cookie cooling racks. Um, and if they, are, if they aren't germinating at the rate, you know, you should know what your sh should, what's expected for a sprout date, how many days. If you're getting beyond that, then change it, you know, but that's, that's a good question. Six to eight weeks before last frost for cool spring. So in mature does not matter, snaps 100, peas 50. So um, I'm not sure if you're asking me about direct sowing outside. Um, we actually don't direct sow out in very early spring because think about it, eight weeks before my last frost date, we classically could have snow here, definitely is still cold seeds are not going to sprout. You're just going to sow them. They're just going to sit out there and wait until their conditions come along. So typically, we only plant transplants in very early spring. And yeah, it does not matter what their maturity date is. Um, that's, we get to a little too caught up, I think, in that sometimes it gets confusing, right? Um, so we plant in fall and we plant in very early spring. And it does not matter what their days to bloom are. Um, that works itself out. Um, because, you know, we don't really do any forecast planning, meaning I'm not looking to say, if I plant snaps now, when are they going to bloom? I mean, I pretty much, after years of doing it, have an idea of when they're going to bloom. But I, I mean, you will also learn, y'all, I was just listening to a video I did that we're working on, um, that when you are in the beginning stages of becoming a flower farmer and you're not doing all the business yet, it is so easy to get into these rabbit holes. Friends, I'm telling you, you will never even think of that again. <laughs> Once you start seed starting, planting, growing, harvesting, preparing, delivering, selling, preventing weeds, making beds, you know what I mean? So we just kind of stick to our planting date dates and then we sell flowers as they actually bloom. So I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but that's what I... Think about that. New book. I'm excited for this. We can order. So thank you for asking that. So my new book, The Cut Flower Handbook, which y'all is a totally gorgeous book. And it is totally packed with so much information. This is the book if somebody says, I want to know how to start and grow a cut flower garden and how to succession plant. Here's your book. Um, and it is so full of beautiful images. Um, there's over, I think it's 66, 66 flowers. You think I would know this by now. Um, there's like a lot of flowers. There's 41 cool season hardy annuals. So there's more cool flowers in this book than there are in cool flowers. But this doesn't talk about necess ne ne the cool flower concept all the growing, how to grow cool flowers, but it's about the individual flowers, how to start them, when to harvest them, tips for starting the seeds, tips for harvesting them, what are my favorite varieties, um, as well as the cut flower concept and then how to do it. Um, it's just such a beautiful book and you can pre-order it. Um, we have a set number of books that we're guaranteed to get when it publishes in February of 2024. So we're able to pre-order those so you can find it on our website. Actually, if you comment book here in the comments, I'll DM you um, the link directly to the book. And when you pre-order while that lasts, you get the instant resource of the Cool Flower Zone Guide. That is a PDF of all 10 of the zones um, with what, when you plant them, spring, fall, very, I mean, very early spring, fall, um, and some even during winter, just depends on where you are. Um, and that's actually a resource that's only available to pre-orders because that's becoming a part of another thing that I'm doing next year. So it'll be taken down as soon as pre-orders um, have been fulfilled. So check it out, it's 30 bucks. Would love to sign a book for you. 
Plus, the other resource you get when the book ships is the flowers that didn't make the book. You know, there's never enough room in a book, y'all. Somebody wrote the other day and said, you know, I was expecting more information about something. It's like, you just, I had no idea. You just have a certain number of words about individual things you can talk about, and you just can't go any deeper, right? Um, and so there were flowers that we really wanted to include that I love to grow, but just wouldn't fit. So when the book ships in February, for everyone that buys a book from us, they will also get the flowers that didn't make the book PDF. Um, so there's two great reasons to buy the book from us. I would love it. Of course, I love it when you buy the book from anywhere. But we have additional resources for you. And if you comment book in the comments here on this live or on any of our posts, I'll DM you um, the actual link directly to the book. So I'm just going to stop and look through the comments to see if somebody commented here before we knew the... If, if my fall planted calendula is blooming now in 7B, will it bloom again in spring? Yep, it will. Um, calendula is like dill. It's borderline winter hardy in zone seven. So, you know, you might want to give it a little row cover, particularly if we have a, a big polar blast like we seem to be getting every year now. Um, but yeah, it'll definitely keep on blooming. I'm super behind on starting plugs. If I start now and plant things out under row covers in January, will it survive? I'm nervous it'll be too late to get good water. Um, yeah, I would not, again, I've already kind of spoken to that. There's really reasons why you should plant during the proper windows. Those plants are not gonna be able to come established in those cold temperatures. Um, the ground will be frozen or really, really cold. I would just wait for the next window of opportunity, um, which would be very early spring, which is six to eight weeks before your last spring frost. All right. Um, oh, thank you, Wanda. There's a good tip. The person that asked if you could, is it viable to be a flower farmer in the city? That's right. Check out Urban Buds. That's our good friend, Mima and Miranda. They're in the middle of St. Louis. Um, and that's the way they earn their living. Um, and Wanda was just there. Their farm was just toured with the ASCFG conference. And if you're a member of the ASCFG, they oftentimes record, they do record the conferences. I do not know if the farm tours are available on video where you can, as a member, you can go into members only and go in there and view that. But yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Ron, um, Wanda. Wanda's our Alaskan peony grower. All right. Um, and so here is, I mean, you're asking all the right questions, cultivating the heart. You have to order, pre-order the book on our website because that's a whole nother system. Um, and so go to the book, the book commenting, commenting book in the comments will send you the link to our website, which is the right place to actually order it. So friends, we are out of time now. Thank you so much. Remember to pre-order a book. Join me Friday at 12 noon for our live show, live shopping show um, inside our app. If you don't have our app, just go to your phone's app store, search Gardener's Workshop, download it, um, and it's free. And if there's a lot of fun functions that are only available inside the app. Um, and so we'd love to have you join us this week. Um, we'll be showing some of these cool flower, dried flowers, as well as a bunch of other good stuff. Um, and so I really appreciate you joining me here today and remember save the date December 9th we're having a gratitude open warehouse the farm is not going to be open but our brand new warehouse that we've just moved in it is a customer gratitude appreciation day um, we're going to have refreshments. We're going to be giving away something at the top of each hour. Um, we're going to have a little sit and chat area where I will be. Um, and, of course, you can shop. It's a great way to pick up last-minute Christmas gifts. And, friends, we're located in Newport News, Virginia. And 
We would love for you to tell your friends and spread the word. Um, and while I always say we anticipate that it's for the locals, we have people drive in from all over. Um, but we would love to have you here. Um, it'll be a fun day. As much of the staff is going to be there. Um, Lane will be there, my co-host and Seed Talk. Um, and you can ask Lane questions. Y'all just love her to pieces. Um, and unfortunately, Bobo will not be able to be there. Um, but the rest of the team will, and we'd love to see you December 9th between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Um, sign up for our newsletter if you want to learn more about it, and we'll keep you in the loop on that. And we're in Newport News, Virginia. All right, friends, till we meet again. Ciao.